It's Nick Black, and on the line in California, I have got one of the most glamorous actors to come out of Hollywood. Her name is Linda Gay Scott. Linda was in many, many TV shows and movies that have become iconic over the years. I'm going to mention a few. Ben Casey, Batman, Bewitched, Bonanza, and they're just the bees, Linda. They're just the bees. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Linda, I want to go way back with you because I've gone to your website, lindagayscott.com. You start talking about your grandmother. Now, is this grandmother on your mother's or father's side? On my mother's side. And she was an actress. Do you know much about her? Were you alive? Oh, yes. And she won awards and all kinds of things. She was amazing. And she started out probably in, I don't know, perhaps the 30s and went into the 40s and then into the 50s. And she won an award with Red Skelton for the Red Skelton Show. She was known as the woman with 100 voices. Of course, all of that has come into my blood. Did she ever know the man with a thousand faces? (laughs) The man with a thousand faces? Well, I'm I'm sorry. I I wish she was here to answer that. But unfortunately, I cannot. I don't know. But Certainly she was known as the actress with 100 voices. She could do dialects, everything. And let me just say also that she was, with regard to her accents, well, she just was incredible. And she was very well known at Walt Disney Studios. She did the voices for so many of those different cartoons and movies, et cetera, et cetera. She was just like a big, big deal in those days. We better mention her name. Her name was Martha Wentworth. That was her stage name. That's the one she would use. My grandmother was from the East Coast with a very la da background. And so I mentioned that because they didn't want her to go into any kind of show business. And they were very snooty. Back in those days, acting wasn't a profession that was looked upon highly. I guess that's right. Did you have much contact? Did she live in New York and you lived in California? She moved out to California from New York, from the East Coast. Did she live with you guys or she had her own place? No, no. she had her own home. Yes, absolutely. There used to be a lot of radio, but um, anyway, she was the Duchess on Red Rider and all of these different shows that I have really no, I, I just was too little or not even born yet. Your father was quite prominent as well, wasn't he? But more in the business world, would I be correct in saying that? Yes, he was very successful. He was commissioner of art for the city of Los Angeles. When I was growing up, there were the parties and the mayor here and the all different walks of life, but they were all very, very successful. Were you an only child? No, I had a brother. And is he still with us? Oh, yes, definitely still with us, but he... <laughs> Kind of, (laughs) he's very successful in his own right. What business is he in, Linda? He owns a great deal of businesses and properties. He followed in your father's footsteps? Yes, and I followed unknowingly. I followed in my grandmother's steps. I was not fond of any of that. And I don't know, it just happened. You had the artistic gene in the family. Well, I just was very shy. Growing up, and it was no big deal because movie stars were all around me all my life. Frank Sinatra, well, the names just, I mean, I could roll them off my tongue right now, but I'm not going to take up the time. In your podcast, you lived around all these well-known people, all all the sons and daughters of these well-known people. Would I be correct in saying that? Yes, and I lived in Brentwood to start, and then I had... Very, very bad asthma as a little girl. So we had to move from Brentwood to Encino. And at that time, we had a big home in Encino. But at that time, it was a time that I can say, well, I had been so ill. I had just had to go always to the Santa Monica Hospital. So as I said, we moved to Encino and one street over was Roy Rogers, Roy and Dale Evans and Clark Gable. And I mean, they were all like, nobodies, weren't they? All nobodies. Right. But to <laughs> me, uh, it, was, it was no big deal for me. Well, as a kid, you don't realize or you don't have the knowledge. No, you're you know? not yeah. impressed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. right. You're just yeah, a you're kid. absolutely correct. And how did they treat you? Asthma, was it pills? Puffers weren't well, around. I was so young. 
I was so young. I was like two, three, four. Encino was over the hill because Brentwood is in one area, which is much more damp and very lovely. But we moved to Encino and it was very dry. And of course, as I said before, with Roy Rogers and all of that, you had to assume there would have been a lot of horses and all kinds of animals all around. It was really terrific. And we were there till I was about 11. Then my father moved our family to Beverly Hills. And daddy was very successful. And actually, the house that my father bought belonged to a gentleman, a well-known one, Elliot Roosevelt. That was where we were. And it was a wonderful home on several acres. And so that's <laughs> that. Elliot Roosevelt, any relation to Teddy and Frankie? Yes, definitely. But, you know, I was young when I was there, and the home had belonged to them. So I can't say exactly. My dad bought it from the Rose- uh, from Teddy Roosevelt. Not Teddy. Um, <laughs> what did I just say? Elliot. <laughs> Elliot. All the, all the Roosevelts, you know. <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, one of the Roosevelt's. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So how did you get into show business? Because first thing, I've got a credit here on the IMDb website, Toast of the Town, which I think was the Ed Sullivan show, as a singer. Is that a correct listing? No. No. Okay. No. There's a Linda Scott who was a singer as well around that time, wasn't there? Yes. Yes. So when you had to do your SAG thing, they can't have anybody with the same name. So you stuck your middle name in there. Is that correct? I always went by the name of Linda Gay Scott, and then there was another girl. I know that she sang a song or something like that, but I didn't know her. I just always used my name, Linda Gay Scott. But later, when I left the business for a bit, then I came back with the name Linda Scott, and then people were saying, no, 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 you have to back to Linda Gay Scott. So anyway, it was like, oh, oh, all right, all right. I don't mean to confuse you. Probably the guys who invented surf music, Jan and Dean. Jan and Dean take Linda surfing. And did they really take you surfing, Linda? Well, (laughs) let me explain. Jan and Dean. Jan was, I don't even know if you're familiar with Jan and Dean music. Surf City? Yeah, yeah. And they were good friends with, right around the same time, was the other group. Beach Boys? Um, Beach Boys, that was it. Yes, the Beach Boys. So in any case, I, I only met them. Let me just say this. Jan was in school. He was way ahead of me, and he was graduating. But he flirted with me so much in school, it was embarrassing, because all I can remember about that Of course, I didn't know he was in music or anything at that time. But all I can say is that he was always flirting with me. And he loved to do that because I would turn red. Being a natural blonde, I mean, I was like... And then, even after he graduated, let's see, I was about 16, maybe 17. I can't recall, but he pulled up next to me. He had already gone out of the school. He pulled up next to me on Sunset Boulevard. I recognized him, of course. And he kind of honked the horn and flirted a little bit. Then we got to a stop signal and all of a sudden he honked the horn in his car. And I looked and there was a big, well, let me just say it the way it was. There was a big bottom sticking out of the window. (laughs) He mooned you. (laughs) (laughs) And of course, I was very naive and I was so embarrassed. As I said, I did blush a lot. So it was uh, simply extraordinary. So I, I just was out of my mind. I was so embarrassed. And he just laughed and laughed and then zoomed off. And I didn't know what to do. I was just highly embarrassed. So that's that story. Then he put you on the record cover. Well, no, it wasn't he. Um, I had graduated high school and I had come back from what is called (laughs) finishing school in Lausanne, Switzerland. And I came back from that, which was a wonderful experience. And Linda, can you say how now, brown cow? (laughs) (laughs) Well... (laughs) Let me think. <laughs> I don't uh, uh, Linda, know that I can, can say how now, brown cow, right this moment in French. I can say other things in French, but I don't know that I can say it right this moment. Did you finish finishing school by any chance? Listen, yeah. I got finished. 
(laughs) (laughs) And my family would always go to every single, like, I don't know, it would be like every year. We would go to the Venice Film Festival or the, where's the one in France? Cannes. Cannes Film Festival, yeah. And of course, I have photographs, but I was only like 16 at that time. You would have had the Frenchmen after you there, Linda? I have photographs on my website. For me, I don't know. I, I wasn't embarrassed or anything, but people were taking pictures of me all the time. I was kind of used to it, but it wasn't any big deal for me. Right. Well, right is better than wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't Oscar Wilde say it's best to be noticed than not noticed? Yes. Well, I suppose, I don't know, sometimes it's... Good to be not noticed. Especially when your hair doesn't look good. Of course, you don't have to worry about that. (laughs) 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 Well, at least you have it. Yeah, at least I have it, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Back to Jan. What are we doing so far? Are we doing well? Let's get back to Jan and the record. Okay. So I was dating this one fellow. He was representing Jan and Dean at the time. He said, come on, I want you to come with me. We're going to go to the beach and there's some things I want you to do, take some pictures, things like that. I had no idea. I wasn't paying any attention, quite frankly. So what came out of that, let me think here. All of a sudden, there were photographers all over the place and I had to change into a bathing suit and it was all over the place. Dan and Dean were just beginning. That's basically what I can say about it. And I was not into acting were doing any of that at the time. Go Do ahead. you remember what beach it was at? It was at the Santa Monica Beach. Back in those days, the surfboards yeah. were humongous because the surfboard is twice your height and Jan and Dean are almost twice their height as well. Absolutely true. My family, we always went to the club and that was at the beach. There were two big clubs down there, the Jonathan Club. There was another one. But anyway, we all did that. So it wasn't a big deal for me. The thing was, I just can say to you that Jan saw me and he turned red because I don't think he knew that I was with my gentleman, that he was my first love. His name was Bruce, which I talk about it in my website. So anyhow, it was fun, but I was so surprised to see Jan. I had no idea that he had been doing music or anything like that. But this was kind of in the beginning. That's because he was too busy flashing at you and flirting with you. (laughs) Well, I assume that when he saw me there, because I had been young, you remember, I told you, like very young when I first started school, and then after that, seeing him pull up on Sunset Boulevard there and and (laughs) moon me, I mean, I would think he'd be embarrassed. I know I probably blushed. And, you know, being a natural blonde, I definitely could turn red easily. It was Jan who had the car accident, not Dean. Absolutely not Dean. We talked not too long ago. He's a terrific guy. Linda, you released a single. Now, was that because of your friend Bruce? Bruce was pushing me to do some singing, and I did have a good voice. But the record that I recorded, that was a demo. And to me, it's dreadful because it was just a demo, and I didn't have all the right kind of music behind. There was music, but it wasn't like a really big deal music. I didn't know what happened to it, but all of a sudden, it had shown up after I began to get back into the business. Anyway, that was Bruce's doing, and I didn't know what happened. I never pushed myself into my acting or anything like that. So, well, some record company, Apogee, I don't know if Apogee, Uh if Bruce had a connection or because that happened quite a bit. Linda, a band or an artist would do a demo and the record company, it's already been recorded. Let's release it. Let's hope for the best. I promise you, I did not even know that there was going to be any release or anything of that nature. Quite frankly, let me tell you, Bruce, there were a lot of reasons that I didn't see him after a while, but which I write about in one of my podcasts. Now, Linda, this demo you recorded, do you remember where it was, what studio or what suburb? No. Let me just think for a minute. I think it had to do, I just know that they were asking me and asking me, and I said, well, it was like a surprise kind of thing. I didn't realize. And they had the music, and then they recorded my voice. But believe me, 
my singing voice was really good at that time. And it's very aggravating to think that I could have really gone someplace and done something to elevate my name as a singer or whatever. But as far as I knew, I never heard anything about anything. So I wasn't pushing myself whatsoever, and I never did. I guess that's all I have to say about that at this moment. Was your friend Bruce, I mean, did he want to push you? Did he want to make you a star? Or Because it's sort of oh, saying... That's a good it's... question. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I mean, from the way you say it, it was done and then it was sort of forgotten by everyone, maybe. Well, I think so. I think that's a good thought. It is conceivable that he may not have wanted me to be elevated. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. Maybe a bit of the old professional jealousy. Well, he was in love with me, and um, I can't say. I really can't say. But I do know that he met my family, and he knew my background, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, I don't know if that, if it made him feel competitive or I can't say. You caught me off guard on that one. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I must say. Do you know if old Brucey is still alive or you would No, know? I've tried to find him, but impossible. I have photographs of him with one of the Beatles, John. Oh, he was running the show with a lot of them. Honestly, by that time, I wasn't with him whatsoever. So it was a surprise for me to even know about it. As we say in the music business, you're a one record wonder. Well, at least I'm a wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Yes. There's two songs that were released, Joey's Last Big Game and The mm -hmm. Spark That Flamed the Fire. Do you remember doing any more? Was it a long session? Did it take all day? Any memories? No, not to my knowledge, no. At that time, I wasn't even trying to do anything as far as working out, making myself famous or pushing anything like that. I mean, I hadn't done any acting at that time. No, what else can I say? So, Linda, how did you get into acting? You know that my grandmother was an actress, right? Yes. And she was well-known, very well-known. But I didn't pay any attention to that because... For me, it was no big deal. And as a matter of fact, she used to try to push me in that direction when I was growing up. And I just didn't pay any attention. And I thought, oh, no. Well, I had a lot of push from many people. Yeah, everybody was pushing. And then I went to acting class. I was in with Lee Strasberg and several people like that. That was in LA, was it? Yes, that yeah. was. And I remember there was a, an actor by the name of Richard Beamer, and he was the male lead with Natalie Wood in what's the big movie? West Side Story. Had. West Side Story. That's exactly right. And he came out to Los Angeles at Beverly Hills. You know, it was no big deal for me because I'd been around the people all the time that were in show business. So anyway, he was invited. I don't know how it happened. But anyway, he came over to the house that we had in Beverly Hills, and we went out for dinner, he and I. And he kept trying to talk me into coming back to New York to be in acting and doing that sort of thing and pursuing it. But I didn't, I really didn't take to him. I thought he was nice, very nice person, very handsome and talented. But I don't know. I just wanted to be probably where I was at home. I was shy. But I did have a good personality, but I was still shy. That's so, why we're talking to okay, you. Okay, well, <laughs> Okay, okay. Did you get an agent? Finally. So you didn't take his finally, advice? He left the scene? No, 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 I did. My father owned so much real estate in West Hollywood, and there was an agent there in one of his buildings, and he approached me and said, let's do something here with your acting. So the first interview I ever went out on was the series called... Hold on, it was about a doctor with Vince Edwards. Ben Casey, calling Dr. Casey. Ben Casey, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. that was it. And I had an introduction billing in that, and I played the daughter of a policeman, and it was a very good part, juicy, as I would say. And anyway, so the long story short on that was that it came across very, very well. And then I think the next one I did was with Gidget, with Sally Field. And that was one of her first shows. I just watched that yeah. episode, Linda, and she looks very, very young. Yes, yes. But I wasn't that much older, but I was more mature. You were after each other's boyfriends or something like that? You were quite strong, well, she, strong women. I wasn't <laughs> after her boyfriend, her boy. Well, I don't know. I don't remember. Anyway, it just was what it was.
Now, the beauty of the internet, Linda, is that most of your TV shows and movies are easily available if you know what you're looking for. Unfortunately, the company that's released, Ben Casey, I think they've only released season one. I've bought the season one DVDs. I have people all over the place trying to find my show, the one that I did, and they've never been able to find it. They've found others, but they haven't been able to discover my show, the one that I did. Which is too bad for me. I think I told you I, I'd interviewed Julie Newmar, your fellow Batman cohort. Yes, yes. And, and she had a series called My Living Doll, and you were in. Yes, a, she did. Yeah, and you were in an episode. I remember asking. I was in an episode of that. Yes. Really? Yes, okay. My Living Doll, season one, episode nineteen, and you play the part of Monica Bird. Oh, that's right. I remember that. That's right. But my gosh, you're so alive to <laughs> find all those things. No, I couldn't. No, no, I couldn't find it, Linda, because when I asked Julie about the show, she said it's on DVD, but only the episodes that still exist. And unfortunately, one of the episodes that don't exist is the one that you're in. I think there's oh, about... how exciting. Facetiously, de- I say. Yeah, I know. How depressing that they're lost forever. Now, if they did release Ben Casey season one, maybe, I don't know, I'm hoping that the studio still has them. I know in England and here in Australia, they would erase the old shows. They would erase them off the videotape and they'd be lost forever. Mm. In the US, it wasn't that bad, but there are... Uh, for instance, My Living Doll, there are episodes missing. Ben Casey was such a big hit. You'd think that it'd still be around, but who knows? You would think. You would think, but yeah. yeah too expensive to keep them. No, I don't know anything about that. I just get my part and enjoy doing it and then move on to the next one. I had an excellent agent and he was so very excited to have discovered me and I was young, but yeah. Now this agent of yours did a fantastic job. Do you remember your first day at work on Ben Casey, your first big show? Any memories? Oh, so excited. It was wonderful. And I recall very well the gentleman that played my father in that. I can't recall his name at the time, but he was well known. And I just, I cried in that part. I mean, he was my father and he was a policeman in that show. I was so emotional in that. And it was strange because after we finished one of our scenes, I didn't have any idea, but the crew, they clapped. (laughs) <laughs> when I finished, of course, I didn't know that that was a delightful thing, but I was so emotional from the part. Anyway, that's just a little aside. The crew are the hardest critics because they're working all day. For them to clap you, you must have put in some great performance. It just was a very emotional thing for me, playing that part. But you know what else? There are things, for example, I went out on an interview with Blake Edwards on a film, and there was another gentleman there, and I think... He was part of the, I would say, probably one of the backers of the movie. And certainly we know that Blake Edwards wasn't poor, but (laughs) they do have people that work with them to put the money behind the film and so forth. I remember going there, and it was a wonderful interview. Blake Edwards was just so nice and so fantastic. And the other gentleman, he was very negative, extremely negative. Towards Um, you? Yes, yes. I mean, if I could say that it was like, Blake Edwards was all for me being in a very good part in the movie. And the other gentleman, he didn't say, no, forget it or anything like that. But he just wasn't very positive about it. And I remember I was very depressed when I left. (laughs) But I thought, I'm a sensitive person. It's strange because at some point I got this stupid, well, not stupid, stupid because it was a Blake Edwards movie, The Party. But in the very beginning, I don't know if you've seen the photograph of me in the opening shot of The Party. Is that where you... I'm in a bikini bathing suit. Yeah, you're in a pink bikini reclining on a one of those... Yeah, yeah, so you have seen it. I have idea, seen it, right? Linda, and I've been a big fan ever since. Oh, <laughs> well, you're not the only one. <laughs> there are so many people wanting that photograph that it's scary. It's a great photo. <laughs> well, it was just obviously he wanted me to be in something that he did. And I was very disappointed because I really didn't want to do a nothing part. But with the same token, it was a Blake Edwards film, so it's important. That's that. Were you going for the Claudine Longier part? You know something? Truly, I have to say, in those days, I loved acting. And, of course, my grandmother had 
forever been after me, after me, like pushing me, pushing me, but I didn't pay any attention to her. And there were so many people in show business and in political positions. When I was growing up and when I was getting older, after I came back from finishing school in Switzerland, and I, I didn't push myself. But then again, I had other people saying, well, you should do this, you should do that, da, da, da. So I would do it. But I'm just trying to let you know that if I had been more aggressive, I would have probably had a better career or more of a career. But with the same token, I have to say that being in Hollywood at that time was a great deal of going to the parties and going out with this person and that person. And I was a little shy and I had a good personality, which I still do, I hope. Yes, you but, do. <laughs> but I, I just, thank you. What I'm trying to say is that I just didn't get into the crowds. And that was probably a mistake because so many people do that and it's great, fantastic. But for me, I wasn't interested. There were a lot of drugs going around and things like that, which nothing's new, I suppose. But I wasn't into it like that. So maybe that's one of my drawbacks. The fact that you've done all this work and by luck or by whatever it is, most of these shows that you've done have become iconic over time. My Favourite Martian is another one. That's on right now, Linda, right here, right now. There are so many good people. Well, I've written about it on some of my podcasts. Like, for example, the part that I got, and I had been retired. I had not gone into show business because I had some tragedy in my personal life. And so I had stopped being an actress 100%. What year was this? This was in the 70s. There was one of the neighbors. I lived in a place called Benedict Canyon. And Benedict Canyon was everybody in LA or let's say Beverly Hills or any of those. Everybody was in show business, it seemed. And so I was jogging one day and I wrote about it in one of my podcasts. But I was jogging one day and Jim Brolin stopped and said hi because he was a neighbor. He and his wife, his first wife at the time, before he married beautiful Barbara. Long story short was, it was he, Jim Brolin, who had said to me, he said, why don't you come up to the house? And it was like maybe, I don't know, a half a block away. And he said, come on up. I'd like to talk to you about some things and come on up and my wife will be there, blah, blah. So I went up and I took a shower, of course, and went up. <laughs> Anyway, he said, there's a, a movie going to be done at Metro, and that was Westworld. And I never heard of Westworld. I had never heard of Michael Crichton. I didn't know Jack about any of that. But it was Jim Brolin who urged me to go and be interviewed for a part in Westworld. I think it was he who arranged everything, and he was amazing, and he was a good friend. He and his wife I knew. It's Good to have friends that you're not just having an affair with somebody, but just to have good friends. It's very important. My interview with Michael Crichton was absolutely incredible. Again, I write about it in my podcast. Michael Crichton took a liking to me, and I thought he was rather nice. Together, we went out on a date. He came to my home, and he was looking in my library of different books, and he said, oh, what about this uh who's the author of this one, and then that one, and so forth. And I gave him the information, and it turned out that it was his books that he had written when he was in school in Harvard, and he had used a nom de plume. And it was absolutely, it blew his mind that I had been so attracted to the books that he had written. And that was really what started a bit of a romance, I should say. Anyway, that's a quickie. <laughs> And just a personal question, Linda, did you reach his shoulder or was he that tall? Oh, he was six foot eight. He was big. Or six foot nine. Yeah. Uh, one or the other, I can't recall. He was a giant. He was so handsome and so charming and so brilliant and actually funny as could be. I wouldn't have ever been attracted to him unless he had a great personality and he was funny. Just, huh? He was wonderful. You weren't attracted because he was a doctor? Well... That's part of his intelligence, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> he wasn't just out to get fame. That was not his intention. He was dedicated to being 
a serious writer. He's one of a kind, was one of a kind. Unbelievable. Can't lot, say enough nice things about him. He wrote a lot of great books, and he made some good movies too as well. Jurassic Park, I think. Was beautiful. after, and he told me about how he got into that. I know of so many things that he divulged. We were really good friends. He just was an amazing man. Linda, I'll just mention a few of the other iconic TV shows that you were in. I watched this again, Batman with Mr. Gorshin. Frank Gorshin. Yep, playing the Riddler, and you were his mole, moth, and... <laughs> it's called moth, M-O-T-H. Gangster's mole. Yeah. You were his gangster's mole. I suppose so. Yeah, that was a nice part, and I want to ask you, how did they get you into that costume? Well... Because um, it was pretty tight. It was. <laughs> it was something they wanted to be very, very, very tight. it was made just for me so it was perfect so you squeezed in no they made it perfection to fit me yes was old frank as funny on the set as he was in real life with doing his comedy stuff no i do a whole thing about that on one of my podcasts but no he was the riddler all the way and very intense He didn't go off whatsoever. He was the Riddler, 100%. Did he stay in his part? Yes, he was 100%. Another William Dozier show that was around... Bill Dozier. He was the head of MGM at one point, right? Um, No, Fox, I think, wasn't he? Was it Fox? No, he was very good friends with our lovely My Living Doll star. Julie Newmar. Yes. They were very close. Oh. And Daddy was one of his best friends, my father. But that didn't have anything to do with me having a part. My father didn't want me to do any part. Oh, really? What were his plans for you? <laughs> to be a <laughs> to be a social, acceptable, lovely, top-of-the-line person, a woman. He didn't care much about me being in film or anything like that. But I had that in my blood because of my grandmother. Actually, my grandmother was in a film... I don't have it written down here. I should have, but she was in a film with Loretta Young, Edward G. Robinson, and who was the great actor, Orson Welles. And he directed and starred in it. And my grandmother played a secondary part, but she was sensational in it. I was astonished to see her in that because, of course, that was way back. It was quite something really quite something and my grandmother did a great job on that so batman and of course the green hornet and that was a similar costume you were wearing except that you had that sort of helmet on and i was glad i watched the episode I, yeah, I was... there was nothing sort of about that helmet <laughs> well <laughs> yes go ahead but, um... i was so glad that you got to take it off i mean you have such lovely hair and uh, i just didn't want that helmet hiding your hair for the whole episode well well aren't you and i on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. We'll give a thumbs down <laughs> to the costume designer on that one. Um, well, a lot had to do with the director, too. Do you remember who it was? No. No. I'd have to look. You played a character called Varma. That's it. Yep. You got it. Yeah. You're so alive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Lena. <laughs> I watched on YouTube, Run Home Slow. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> what a movie. <laughs> it's a classic, That's Linda. That's stupid. Oh, it's a classic. it was such a weird movie. Yeah. Well, it was hard not to fall asleep. Well, I didn't have anything to do with it. And the director, I, I went out um, for the, if you want me to tell you, um, I went out on an interview for that. And the director just said, oh, you're perfect. You're perfect for this part. Da, 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 da. But when I heard that the actress was uh, that was uh, starring in it, what's it's her name? Mercedes McCambridge. Oh, Mercedes McCambridge, yes. And, of course, she was so fantastic in Giant. That just, you know, nailed it for me because the director hadn't directed before. I didn't really care much about anything. All I wanted to do was to perhaps get some film and do something. I promise you, that was just absolutely a mind blower. Oh, when I looked at that, I said, oh, no, no, no. (laughs) There was nothing I could do about it. Anyway, it was the stupidest movie. In any case, I won't downgrade it any more than I already have. (laughs) Do you remember where where it was? Somewhere in the desert. Yes, out in the Mojave Desert. Oh, it must have been hot. Well, (laughs) 
you think? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah. I'm telling you, it was so hot. It was so bloody hot. It was ridiculous. And I remember, I'm going to sound a little spoiled on this. I remember we had a fantastic lady that worked in our home. She'd been with us for years and she cooked and she was just like part of the family, actually. She would go and she would be there just to kind of check things out and to help me and whatever. She just wanted to be the person to make sure that I was taken care of properly. And she was an amazing lady. And all the time, I can't even tell you, if she hadn't been there, I think I would have had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> She was absolutely fantastic and made it a lot easier for me to do my part. But it wasn't fun, even though it may look like fun, but I don't think it does or did. Yeah, her name was Mabel and she was from Mobile. Alabama. Well, you know what, Linda? You survived that movie. Run home slow. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> My goodness. It's there on YouTube for everyone to see. Run home slow. And I don't think the director, Ted Brenner, that might have been his first movie, but I think it was his last one as well. Oh, I'm sure of it. Are you kidding? <laughs> that was, yes. Well, you know, <laughs> I've already been emotional enough about to hint about how that was. Yes. Yes. But you were in some good movies too, besides Westworld. One of my favorites was Little Faust and Big Halsey, Big Halsey, which could have been, I think, with a better title. Well, the fact that Robert Redford is such a cad, he is a bad man. No, in the movie. Yeah, yes, his character. He, he was amazing. He was a gentleman all the way. Never, ever, ever anything but a complete gentleman and absolutely couldn't have been nicer. And he was just great. Absolutely great. And I think the director, perhaps, it didn't necessarily work very well with him. No. I'm just saying because the film was not a big success. It has a bit of a cult following, though, I think. Well, then, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I speak with great candor, as yeah. you know. Okay, <laughs> yes. go ahead. Did you ride a motorbike in the movie as well, Offset? Yeah, because I rode with brought at Redford. Where was that shot, Linda? Not the Mojave again? Was, no, no, that was shot in Arizona. Albert Ruddy produced Little Fossil. Yes, Al Ruddy, yeah. yes. He was great. He and his wife, they were both on location, and I kept saying, there's a scene in here that I do not want to do, and I cannot, da-da-da-da-da. I said, can you do something? Can you change something? I was absolutely mortified, but anyway, I won't go into that now. The, oh, um, you, will, the sex you don't have to say it. Okay, no, I think I know which scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, they showed a bit of you there, I think, didn't they? Oh, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> well, I want people to see the you movie. Rascal. Oh, Linda. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I know, I know, I know. I want people to see that movie because it's an interesting film. I'd call it an interesting failure. How's that? Well, that's fine. Just fine. I wonder if old Bob Redford... <laughs> Shows it off in his resume when he's going for his next acting gig. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> you think not? <laughs> I think not, no. <laughs> he doesn't screen it in Utah or on his VHS recorder, no? Oh, yeah, he can't wait to put that at the top of the list of his great movies. Obviously, above Butch Cassidy. It made Butch Cassidy look like a D-grade movie. Well, Butch Cassidy, you know who was in that, and Paul Newman, right? Yes, of course. Listen, I can say only the best things about Robert Redford. Okay. He is a brilliant, fantastic, top-of-the-line actor, and he is so professional, and he's just dedicated and couldn't be nicer. Another cult classic. Well, this has definitely got a cult following is the Lost in Space show where you played a hippie chick, a space-age hippie chick. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. With Daniel Trevanti, who went on to Hill Street Blues. Oh, did he? Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. You were right. I don't think I was acting at that time, but I don't know. That would have been the 80s, Hill Street Blues. Okay, uh, well, I was not doing any business then, not acting at all. Why, Linda? What made you quit? I got married, and I had a little boy. I've got written here Michael Lachlan. Is that your husband? Laughlin, and he had a tragic accident and died. Oh, was it a car accident, was it? No, it was a drowning accident. Your late husband, was he the producer? Did no, that was a totally different person. Oh, okay, right. Because they've got the same name, Michael Lachlan. Lachlan. Yes, I know. <laughs> and I, I, I was very astonished when I heard that there was a director by the name of Michael Laughlin. But that was after. What did yeah. your husband do? Well, he came from a very interesting family. And there was just a good deal of investments 
and things of that nature that he, he and his family had made and throughout this for a long time. And he was a stockbroker and ran his whole, all of the family, what do you call it, the, the family portfolio, etc. But that was in, I got married in 68, so that was a very, very bad time. Did he drown and, back then? Was it that long ago, was it? Well, no, he drowned in the 70s. But, you know, in 68, 69, 70, you know, we had the big Vietnam War and everything went to hell in a handbasket, financially, yeah. I should say. Oh, I've heard that on one of your podcasts. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I should mention again, lindagayscott.com is your website and you've got a lot more detail than we're discussing here. And so I urge listeners to check out lindagayscott.com and there's also the animal charity there as well. We should mention that and people can buy pictures to help out animals. We don't push anybody whatsoever. We try to save as many animals as possible and take care of them. And if we can get them homes and things of that nature, it's cats, dogs, horses, donkeys everything and anything. We just love animals. Now, Linda, can I ask, do you mind if I ask, what happened to Michael? Was it uh, in the ocean or...? No, it was in a pool, actually, and he um, hit his head, dived in. That's what happened. Were you there at the time? No, no. He and I were not really together. Actually, what I have gone through in my life I am writing a book. It would blow people's mind. And we're talking about what happened to me all over the world. And I was in some severe, severe, scary situation. I'm lucky that I'm alive, quite frankly. It's been quite a trip. Are you going to publish this book? Is it going to come out? Oh, well, I hope to. But I think even more than that, it's a series. Oh. <laughs> I'm a theory. <laughs> uh, it, it really, it, it, it's really extraordinary. That is something I want to. People are going to say, no, could she, uh, you know, that kind of a thing. So, yes, it's really been a wild and crazy bumpy ride. Well, when you finish that book, Linda, you know who to call us and we'll talk about it. Well, you better just keep in touch. I will. I will. I've got your email. Okay. Looking forward to it. You're my good pal now. (laughs) Fantastic. Uh, Quickly, we're running out of time. Hammersmith is out. I just watched that where you played the real estate agent in that car. Oh, that was, that's a story, but that's like another interview. Okay. Because that that is a story. (laughs) Did you end up meeting Dick and Liz, as we call them here? She almost... (laughs) was the reason that I didn't get the part. Oh, was she jealous of you? Well, I can't say that. I really can't say that. But I can say that I think that she liked to be the main, you know, she was a beautiful woman. And even though time was passing, she still was, um, you know, she was Cleopatra. That's right. It's a story. And there are other things that happened to me just because of the way I looked and I didn't get certain things and parts or whatever. As they say, it was a bummer. Here's another word or another little far out man. (laughs) Really. I do want to mention that there was a movie, Psych Out, and that, of course, was one of Jack Nicholson's. And the director, uh, well, let me say this. Susan Strasberg was a friend because I had gone to acting class with her dad. She became a friend, and it was she outing for me to get any kind of a part. So she was also a darling. When you make a friend in Hollywood, in the business, and usually it can be any kind of business that you're in, especially in show business, if you make a friend, they can be great friends. She was. And that's why I got the part in Walk uh, <laughs> talk, uh, nah. Psych Out. Yes, yes, yes. And then Jack Nicholson is another story again. (laughs) And so is Marlon Brando. That's another story. Uh, All right. Well, I'll let you go. And and I thank you so much for calling and for having this interview. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. You've been wonderful. And I will recommend you to as many stars as I meet. (laughs) I, I I don't meet them very often, but I will say to you that you are a fantastic interviewer. Oh, thank you very much, Linda. You know what? I'm going to edit the interview, but I'm not going to edit that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't. Yes, no, yes. No. Well, Linda, I want to thank you very much for yes. taking time. Everything is good, and I've had great fun, as you can tell, because I've been giggling and <laughs> laughter has been all over the place, and it's been a good 